With today's sermon in our series, Life Hacks, Pocket Tips from Proverbs for Better Living, here is Senior Pastor Mark Rader. You are probably familiar with the non-biblical proverb that goes like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Yes, names will never hurt me or words will never hurt me, depending on the variation that you learned. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is good wisdom, isn't it? Uh, it encourages us from time to time uh, to allow words that might be insulting or hurtful just to kind of pass us by. Uh, they're not going to do any physical damage, so just let it go. Right now, of course, how it's used on the playground means that we rarely let it go because we respond to an insult or a name by saying, sticks and stones may never hurt me, but words, uh, uh, but words will never hurt me. And uh, that uh, we tend to say it in a sneering kind of sing-song way, which just makes the whole situation worse. Um, and we often actually reflect not so much on when that proverb is true, but on kind of what it's lacking, right? Which is that sometimes words can, while they may not break a bone, can be really devastating, right? Uh, there's a variation on that, sticks and stones may break my bones and words will break my heart. Right? We know the power of words, uh, to both to devastating effect but also to positive effect. Uh, the healing uh, use of words can be very, very prominent for us as well. And we've know, we know the power of words. And as a modern culture, as a postmodern culture I should say, we're perhaps more aware of the power of words than just about any other generation before us. Uh, there's a significant, um, a significant philosophical understanding of words that undergirds a lot of what we do. You know, you think about political, cor politically correct language or inclusive language, that wasn't necessarily politically motivated or designed to make our lives miserable. It was actually designed to be aware that sometimes our language can be really exclusive. It can be really insulting. So the desire wasn't to make our lives more complicated by giving us particular words we can and can't use. It was recognizing the power of words. Uh, and, and so we, we are very aware, but we're not the first society to be aware of the power of words, are we? Uh, as long as people have been speaking, I think they've been aware of the power of words. Uh, we've all probably had words spoken to us or at us or over us uh, that have influenced us both positively and negatively. And therefore, because how we use our words is so in, in influential and because it can lead to our success in life, those who teach wisdom literature uh, throughout history have talked about how to use words wisely. And the book of Proverbs is no, uh, is no exception to that. Uh, there's a number of, of, of teachings about how we ought to use our words wisely. Um, the, one of the first is that those who are wise in their use of words won't use many words. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Proverbs is chapter 17, verse 28. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Uh, you want to be uh, perceived as wise? Don't speak, right? Uh, that way you'll probably come out looking all right. Uh, it's one of my favorites because of a Simpsons episode, actually, where uh, Lisa says that to Homer, and in his mind he says, what does that mean? I don't know. I better say something. <clears throat> and so he says, takes one to know one, <laughs> which just made me laugh and still makes me laugh. Right? So there's something about wise use of language, which means we should use less language. Uh, those who are wise in their language will also uh, speak truthfully, right? And so in uh, Proverbs 12, 7, says that an honest witness tells the truth, which might sound like a little bit of a no-brainer, but it's actually quite significant. Those who are honest, those who are wise, are the ones who will speak truth, and those who speak truth are those who are honest. And in both cases, we actually have, uh, shall we say, some, there's a connection between our words and what's going on inside, right? So if you are a fool and you keep your mouth shut, chances are you're going to come across okay. If you open your mouth, it's when people speak that you realize what they do and don't know, right? Uh, and so there's a connection between what we say and who we are. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. 
But the one that I want to have a look at today is actually found in Proverbs chapter 15, because not only do the wise use few words, not only do the wise speak truthfully, but the wise also speak in a way that shows prudence and discretion. So Proverbs uh, chapter 15, verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, This is one of those kind of pretty easily observable truths, isn't it? Uh, We've all been in those situations, haven't we, where we're in the middle of a conversation and something is said, and you have those little two voices in your head. Uh, Depending on how you respond, the conversation will continue to be a conversation or it will become an argument, right? Depending on what you say. Uh, On the one hand, there's that cool, calm, collected, rational, smart thing to say, and then there's the thing you really want to say, right? Uh, Which tends to be less cool, less calm, less collected, and can stir up more anger. We've all been in those sorts of situations, haven't we? Uh, And this wisdom is pretty straightforward, isn't it? There's a reason why you should sleep on that email before you send it, right? It's one of the great dangers of Twitter, is it not? How many times have we seen tweets go out and then get deleted once the folly of what has been said is realized uh, or recognized in some sort of a way? And and we're aware, of course, that even how we respond can can make things better or worse, right? Uh, We know, we, we know this, that if someone says something to us and we automatically attack back or we get defensive, it's not gonna end well. Uh, This is, shall we say, a fairly straightforward proverb in lots of ways. But it's actually worth reflecting on other times and other places where a gentle word can turn away wrath. Because it's not always just ours, right? It's not just my reaction in the moment when I get riled up and I think there's two ways this conversation could go. Do I want to kind of keep it calm or do I want to step this thing up? There are other circumstances where our answers, the way that we respond, can actually influence other people. So, for instance, sometimes uh, people are angry at us. I'm sure that's never happened to any of you, right? But people get angry at us, sometimes for justifiable reasons, sometimes for not justifiable reasons. It doesn't really matter. People get angry with us, and we have the opportunity to respond, right? And, And in those moments, we have an opportunity to respond in a gentle way. What are two of the gentlest words in, in, in our language? I'm sorry, right? Uh, And and that's often one of the softest, gentlest things we can say, isn't it? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. I didn't mean to insult you. I'm sorry. I don't quite understand why you're reacting the way that that you are. I'm I'm sorry. Can we we talk this through, right? And our gentleness can often uh, help us manage conflicts, right? It can help us manage a situation and find a place and a way to hear what might need to be heard, uh, to hear what needs to be said, and then move forward in a more constructive sort of way. Sometimes, however, we can be giving a gentle answer so that other people don't do something stupid. I think this gets played out on soccer pitches and football fields every weekend across Australia, doesn't it? Uh, A call is made or is not made, a uh, foul is given or it is not given, an insult is made or whatever it might be, and soon you got two blokes, and I'm sure it happens with women's sport as well, but I'm going to stick with blokes. Two blokes are nose to nose with their two mates next to them saying gentle words, right? (laughs) Calm down, settle down, you don't need this, don't get kicked out, don't get a yellow card, don't give away a penalty, don't get into a fight, just settle down, right? And this sort of thing happens fairly frequently, shall we say. Uh, and and you know, there's, there's lots of other examples. One of my favorite biblical examples actually takes place in Second uh, uh, Kings chapter 5, where Naaman, the military leader of the Syrians, uh, very, very successful but has a, a skin disease, leprosy, uh, and his Hebrew slave girl tells him that there's actually a prophet in Israel who can heal him. So he gets his king to write to the king of Israel and say, hey, can you please heal my military commander? The king of Israel thinks, oh, great, who heals leprosy? Nobody. He's just trying to pick a fight with me. Elisha hears about it. He's the prophet and says, send him to me. Naaman comes to Elisha's house, and Elisha sends his servant out uh, and says, listen, just go bathe in the Jordan River seven times, and you'll be uh, kind of, you'll be right, right to go. And Naaman is furious. He's infuriated by the fact that the prophet himself didn't come out, and then he wants him to bathe in the lousy Jordan River. He says, we've got heaps better rivers up in Syria. Why am I going to bother with this block? And we're told that his servant comes to him in the midst of his rage and says, my Lord... 
If he'd asked you to do something amazing, if he'd given you like the 12 tasks of Hercules, but kind of biblical, wouldn't you have done that? So how much more so when he asks you to do something simple? And Naaman responds. He goes, you're right. Goes and bathes in the Jordan River seven times and is cured. But someone spoke up with a gentle word in the midst of his wrath to make sure that he didn't miss out on what he was about to miss out on. Sometimes, of course, it's not, it's not uh, the person that we're concerned with, it's actually somebody else who's not us. Uh, for those of you who might uh, be in middle management, this may have happened to you before, uh, where your uh, direct supervisor is very upset with someone who reports to you, who is not in the room, and if they were, they might not be in the company anymore, and you have an opportunity to speak into that circumstance or situation, right? Again, a biblical example we actually looked at last Sunday evening is that of Abigail. Uh, King David is not yet King David. He's uh, kind of hiding out from Saul in the wilderness. Uh, and he is insulted by a fairly significant uh, wealthy landowner in Judea. And David, in this fit of rage, decides that he's going to kill him and his entire household. Straps on the sword and 400 men all march off. Uh, and Abigail, uh, who is this Judean master's wife, uh, hears about it and she puts together a gift of food, gets on her donkey and rides out to meet David and gives one of the most persuasive speeches uh, recorded in Scripture. And not only is it incredibly persuasive, but it is essentially full of gentleness. Uh, her answer to David when she finally meets him is essentially, I'm sorry, this was my fault. If I had seen your servants, none of this would have happened, but unfortunately, they went to my husband, and my husband is an idiot. Um, so part of her gentle language was to throw her husband under the bus. We'll deal with that one some other time. And then she also then appeals, though, to his better nature, says to him, listen, you know, you, you know that God is going to make you king, and you do not want this murder of someone like Nabal on your conscience. Uh, and besides, here's a big gift of food. Uh, and uh, David hears both her words and sees the gift, and his anger is appeased. And not only is Nabal and his household spared, at least for the moment, but David's own righteousness is preserved in the midst of it. A gentle word turns away wrath. Sometimes this might work out as well, shall we say, uh, in family units. Right? Have you ever seen this work out or have, have been the middle person, the middle man, the middle woman in a conflict in your family? Right? Mom or dad are cranky with sibling B, and so sibling A steps in to defend sibling B and kind of smooth the waters, as it may be. That well, can sometimes happen, can't it? And so we know the truthfulness of this sort of thing. However, can I just say that a family situation raises at least one circumstance when this proverb is perhaps not entirely apt. It's one of the things that we've observed in the, in the last few weeks as we've been looking at Proverbs. There are times when Proverbs are, are, not more, are more true than at others, right? There's times when they really work and there's times when they don't, right? And there's a time for us to basically say to people, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me and allow things to pass us by. And there are other times when we need to respond. There are times when this proverb, a gentle answer turns away wrath, may not be the proverb we want to live by. A number of uh, weeks ago now, six or seven weeks ago, we had Carolyn Cousins with us. Uh, she was speaking about domestic violence. Many of you were here, you remember that. Uh, and one of the things that she talked about was uh, one of the centerpieces of the definition around domestic violence, and that is the sense of fear that pervades a home where that's the case, right? Uh, she talked about the language that people would use about having, feeling like they were walking on eggshells, right? Uh, and we've all been in those situations, perhaps not in a domestic violence situation, but where you just know you've got to kind of walk on eggshells around somebody, and it can kind of feel like we're being wise, can't it? Right? We're being gentle. We're, we're making sure that we don't stir them up. But there's a big difference between turning away wrath and just allowing somebody to continue to control your life or the lives of those around them or to affect or continue abuse. And as Carolyn reminded us, uh, we cannot associate domestic violence with an anger management issue, right? The two very different sorts of things. And so there's a time and a place, if we find ourselves in a situation where we are walking on eggshells around somebody, it may be that this proverb is not the proverb to apply to that situation, because there's a big difference. And there's also times, aren't there, where, some, where we speak truth 
that leads to an angry response, but the truth needs to be spoken. And just a couple of weeks ago, we I uh, filled in a whole bunch of uh, cards with our Catalyst ministry to send to the CEO of a clothing manufacturer who had not reported to Baptist World Aid about their supply chain and therefore had received an F in the latest ethical fashion guide. We filled in all sorts of cards. We filled in hundreds of them. They were doing them all over the place. And some CEO somewhere got thousands and thousands and thousands of little postcards, very politely worded, asking them to actually be a little bit more kind of upfront about their supply chain. How do you think the CEO will respond? Now, I don't know. I don't know who they are or whether it's a he or a she. I have no idea, really. But don't you think it's reasonable to suppose that they might be a little bit cranky with a whole bunch of people who may or may not even buy their clothes, certainly aren't now, who want them to reduce their profit margins, right, and do a whole bunch of more work? But the truth needed to be addressed, doesn't it? Again, biblically speaking, 1 Kings chapter 22, the wicked king Ahab is uh, allied himself with the godly king Jehoshaphat. They're about to go to war against the Syrians. And uh, as kings did in the ancient world, they uh, got the prophets in and said, listen, are we going to be successful? Can you inquire of the gods for us? And because uh, Ahab was not a very godly man, well, actually he was. He had lots and lots of gods. They just weren't the Lord. He brings all the prophets together and the prophets all basically give a united answer, which is you are going to be successful. And Jehoshaphat says to him, listen, is there a prophet of the Lord that we could inquire of? And Ahab says, yes, there's one, but I don't like him very much because he never says anything nice about me. Uh, And Jehoshaphat says, well, can we call him in any ways? And so they do. And Micaiah comes in and Ahab says to him, so should I go or not? And Micaiah goes, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. It's going to be a raging success. And Ahab says, how many times do I have to tell you to tell me the truth? He says, fine. I see all Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. You go to this battle, you're not coming home. Ahab, we're not told about his emotional state, but we can guess from his actions. He says, oh yeah? I'll tell you about when I'm coming home. I'm going to come home and you're going to stay in jail until I do. How long do you think Micaiah stayed in jail? Well, it was the rest of his life because Ahab did not come home. The truth led to an angry response, but the truth was important. You ever been in those situations? You know that this isn't going to be taken very well. You know this is going to be one of those hard conversations. And yes, we have to be careful about how we address truth. Yes, we have to be careful about the ways in which we speak that. And there's all those rules and lessons that we learn about, you know, don't attack the person, right? Attack the problem, all of those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the truth may be more important, right? And then, of course, there's one other circumstance where I think it's important that we be careful about this uh, little proverb. And that is when we are dealing with the easily angered or hot-tempered person. There's a whole bunch that uh, Proverbs has to say about these sorts of people. In chapter 15, verse 18, it says, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. In uh, chapter 22, uh, verse uh, 24 and 25, It says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person, do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. And what will you be ensnared in? Well, chapter 29, verse 22 says, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. There's probably a time and a place when, instead of getting in between your mate and whoever he's picking a fight with on the soccer pitch, where you just need to say, you know what? You need to bear the consequences of your folly. And I need to stand over here and watch that happen. There comes a time and a place where if you spend too much time with someone who always stirs up conflict, right? Or someone who's always hot-headed, who always just jumps in and says stuff without thinking. Someone who always allows their temper to be right at the surface where you may need to say, you know what? This is not the proverb for me to use. The new proverb is find a new friend. Right. I need to go and find someone else so that I'm not continually in this circumstance and situation. And this, of course, requires enormous wisdom, doesn't it? Wisdom is not easy. Right? The Proverbs sound remarkably simple until you try to apply them, don't they? A gentle answer turns away wrath and a harsh word stirs up anger. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course it does. Until we start thinking through all the various ways in which that takes place. But I do want to kind of come back to something I mentioned at the outset. You see, one of the things about uh, wisdom 
in the Bible is that it's a little bit secular. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. And what I mean by secular is not that it's not religious or spiritual, but it's, it's observational truth. You don't actually need to be a follower of Jesus. You don't need to have the Holy Spirit at work in your life to know that a harsh answer stirs up wrath, do you? That's just observational truth. You don't need some sort of prophetic revelation from God for us to work that one out. You probably work with people who have a great deal of gentleness and a great deal of self-control in their speech, and part of that's just because they figured this one out. Right? We learn this from experience, don't we? I'm, I'm a lot better than I used to be at giving a gentle answer because I've just learned along the way. As I mentioned at the outset, there's a really significant connection between our words, as far as the Proverbs are understood, and we would see this across Scripture, and what's going on inside of us. Uh, Jesus actually talks about this in Matthew chapter 12. He's confronting the religious leaders of the day, and in chapter 12, verse 34, he says this, "'You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of.'" And here's where we who fear the Lord can take this proverb and think about it just a little bit differently. Think about it in a way that perhaps our bosses, employers, family members, and friends may not because they do not fear the Lord. You see, we look at this truth and we think, you know, this is how God made the world. He made the world in such a way that gentle speech and a little bit of speech and honest speech will lead to success. That, that's why this thing works. But as those who fear the Lord, we also recognize that it's not just a matter of experience. It's not just a matter of getting better at biting our tongue. It's actually about answering the question, what's in our hearts? Because if my heart is not gentle, if my heart has no self-control, then it is going to be remarkably difficult for me to continue to bite my tongue. Because eventually... My mouth will speak what my heart is full of. And if my heart has not been changed, if my heart has not become a little bit more conformed to the person of Jesus, then eventually I'm going to be the wrong example of Proverbs 15.1. The fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that long list of characteristics uh, that make us more like Jesus. The last two, gentleness, self-control. It's one of the promises that we are given. That the Holy Spirit at work in our lives as we follow after Jesus will conform ourselves, conform our hearts, conform our lives, and therefore conform our words to those of Jesus. To be people who speak a gentle word at the right time because our hearts are full of gentleness, our hearts are full of of self-control. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I'm sure you've seen it at work. I sure, I'm sure you've learned this lesson even if you didn't know it was in the Bible before. The question is, are we going to be people who just, I don't know, learn from experience? Or are we going to open our, ourselves up to allow the Holy Spirit to make us into truly wise people who fear the Lord. And because we have been transformed into His likeness, are able to speak gently at the right time, to say the right word in season. So by all means, use your words carefully. Words are very powerful. Let's be very careful with them. But let us ultimately be those who fear the Lord and be truly wise. Another pocket tip from Proverbs for better living. We hope you've enjoyed today's New Horizons program. You can download the companion study guides for each program from the Guy Mayer Baptist Church website. Go to guymearbaptist.org.au forward slash New Horizons. These are available for each episode or you can download the whole series. Guy Mayer Baptist Church in Sydney's southern suburbs is a contemporary evangelical church seeking to serve our local community and help them to know Jesus. At the heart of all we do is the desire to help people love God 
in all aspects of their lives. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so via the contact page on our website or visit our Facebook page. The words we speak have incredible power to do things. We know this in the words that have been spoken to us, words that have been both very harming but also very healing. And that's particularly true when we're talking about situations and circumstances where things can get angry, when there's conflict. And the words that we say certainly require gentleness, they certainly require self-control. And this is observed everywhere we go. But for those of us who follow Jesus, it also begs the question, is my heart, from where my words come, full of gentleness, full of self-control, like that of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I trust that you've been encouraged today to think a little bit more deeply about your words and their source. We hope to see you again real soon. God bless.